Welcome back to week four of our read along virtual book club for Kate DiCamillo's Flora and Ulysses. Today we're going to be starting with chapter 31 and we're going to read two more chapter sections. Um, we're getting to the middle of our story. It's super exciting. Last time we left off on a little bit of a cliffhanger. We found out that not only does Ulysses know how to type and like type what he's really thinking, but now we know he knows how to fly. We're going to figure out what happens with that. We also found out that he has a nemesis and we're on the lookout for who that, well, we know who that is, um, but we're on the lookout to see what's going to happen with that. I'm going to show you guys again how we get on to Tumble Books, which is where we're reading our story. Okay, so we start on the Sable Library homepage, uh, which is sablelibrary.org, and then we click on the tab for children's, the tree, we click on the tab for tumble books, load, we go to ebooks. Once again, our book is right here. So I'm going to click on Flora and Ulysses. I'm going to hit read online because that's what we're doing today. We see our cover and it has our chapter section menu. So we read these two sections last week, 21 to 25 and then 26 to 30. So now we're going to start with chapter 31. A little bit of an issue we have is that, which isn't really a problem, um, but the tip top of our chapter um, for the first chapter in every chapter section seems to be cut off. But like I keep saying, I do have a book with me here. So our chapter title for chapter 31 is Holy Unanticipated Occurrences, which we already know is something that Flora recognizes from her favorite comic book. So I'm gonna jump right in. Chapter 31. Flora watched Ulysses fly over her, his tail extended at full length and his front paws delicately pointed. It was just like her dream. He looked incredibly, undeniably heroic. Holy Goomba, said Flora. She climbed on top of the booth so she had a better view. When Incandesto flew, when he became a brilliant streak of light in the darkness of the world, he was usually headed somewhere to save someone. And Dolores was always flying at his side, offering advice, encouragement, and wisdom. Flora wasn't sure exactly what Ulysses was doing, and it didn't look like he really knew either, but he was flying. George Buckman, whispered his father, how do you do? He does that a lot. Flora had forgotten about her father. He was looking up at Ulysses and he was smiling. It wasn't a sad smile. It was a happy smile. Pop, said Flora. There was a long, loud scream for Rita. It was in my hair, she shouted. Someone threw a donut at Ulysses. Flora climbed out of the booth so that she could stand next to her father. She slipped her hand into his. Holy unanticipated occurrences, said Flora's father in the voice of Dolores. It had been a long time since Flora had heard her father say those words. His name is Ulysses, she told him. Her father looked at her. He raised his eyebrows. Ulysses, he said. He shook his head, and then he laughed. It was a single syllable. Ha! And then he laughed longer. Ha, ha, ha! Flora's heart opened up inside of her. Do not hope, she whispered. And then she noticed that the cook was leaping and twirling, waving his knife and trying to reach the flying squirrel. She looked up at her father. She said, this malfeasance must be stopped, right? Right, said her father. And since her father agreed with her, Flora stuck out her foot and tripped the man with the knife. Chapter 32, Sprinkles. So we see Ulysses thinking, I love Flora. And then we have Rita screaming that he was in her hair. We see him flying. We see the man with the knife. Sunny side up. He's flying and he's flying to the exit, but it's closed. Splat. I flew. Where's Flora? Is that a piece of donut? Sprinkles. Is the sprinkles feels so good and then he passes out. Chapter 33. Does rabies itch? His eyes were closed. His head was bleeding. Flora knew from terrible things can happen to you that head wounds bleed excessively, whether they're bad or not. All head wounds bleed excessively, she said to her father. Don't panic. Okay, said her father. Use this. He handed her his tie. Flora knelt down. She had a very powerful sense of deja vu. Was it just yesterday that she had bent over the body of an unknown squirrel in Tootie's backyard? Ulysses, she said. She dabbed at the blood with the tie. The squirrel didn't open his eyes. An eerie quiet descended. The whole of the giant donut became 
preternaturally calm. Everything, the donuts, the squirrel, her father, seemed to hold its breath. Flora knew it was happening. She had read about it in Terrible Things Could Happen to You. It was the calm before the storm. The air becomes still, the birds stop singing, the world waits, and then the storm comes. Inside the giant donut, there was a moment of deep quiet, a collectively held breath, and then someone said, I think it was a rat. But it was flying, said another voice. It was in my hair, said Rita. The cook shouted, I'm going to call the cops. That's what I'm going to do. Rita was right behind him. Forget about the cops, Ernie. Call the ambulance. I have rabies. It was in my hair. You, said Ernie. He pointed at Flora with his knife. You tripped me. That's her, said Rita. She's the one. Plus, she brought that thing in here in the first place. Dressed it up like a baby doll. I did not, said Flora. Dressed him up like a baby doll. And this is all your fault. The criminal element said that sometimes it was wise to put criminals on the defensive by making slanderous or blatantly untrue comments. The surprising unfairness of this tactic will often stop criminals in their tracks. It seemed to work. She opened her mouth and closed it again. My fault, she said. Flora bent over Ulysses and put a finger on his chest. She felt his heart beating in a slow, thoughtful way. Gratitude and relief washed through her, and her own heart, which had been beating much too quickly, slowed inside her chest. It answered the squirrel's heart with its own measured thud, thud, thud. Ulysses, her heart seemed to say, Ulysses. I'm calling the cops, said Ernie. George Buckman, how do you do? shouted Flora's father. Is there any reason to call the police? Well, for one, said Rita, it was in my hair. Do you think the police should be notified of a squirrel in your hair, said Flora's father? The idiocy of this question, its unsettling logic, made Flora suddenly grateful for her father. She picked up Ulysses and cradled him in her left arm. I think I can feel the rabies coming on, said Rita. My stomach itches. Does rabies itch, said Flora's father. I'm going to call somebody, said Ernie. She tripped me. Whom do you think it would be wise to call on this matter of the tripping, said Flora's father. He opened the door. He gestured for Flora to walk through it. She did. The door swung shut behind them. Run, said her father, and they both began to run. At some point, Flora's father started to laugh again. It wasn't a ha-ha-ha kind of laugh. It was a ho ho wee kind of laugh. Hysteria, thought Flora. She knew... She knew what to do for hysteria. Her father needed to be slapped. Unfortunately, there wasn't time right now. They had to make their getaway. Her father laughed all the way to the car. He laughed when they were in the car. He laughed as he placed his hands at 10 o'clock and two. He laughed as he backed out of the parking lot and drove away from the giant donut. He stopped laughing only once, long enough for him to shout, holy bagoomba, in the voice of Dolores the parakeet. And then he went back to laughing. Chapter 34, The Getaway. They were making their getaway, but they were making their getaway slowly, because even when Flora's father was thinking that things were hilarious, even when he was talking like a parakeet, he still apparently did not believe in speed. Flora kept looking behind them to see if they were being followed by the cops, or Rita and Ernie. When she finally looked down at Ulysses, his eyes were still closed, and a terrible thought occurred to her. What if he has a concussion, she said to her father. Her father, of course, laughed. Flora tried to remember what terrible things can happen to you, said about concussions. There was something about making the person with a head injury speak a favorite nursery rhyme so that speech patterns, slurring, etc., could be evaluated. Flora stared at the squirrel. He couldn't speak. Also, she doubted he knew any nursery rhymes. There was a very small cut on his head. The bleeding had stopped, and he was breathing softly, regularly. Ulysses, she said. And then she remembered, in its entirety, an ominous sentence from Terrible Things. It is absolutely imperative that you keep the potentially concussed, concussed patient awake at all times. She shook the squirrel gently. His eyes stayed closed. She shook him harder, and he opened his eyes and then closed them again. Flora's heart thudded once and then dropped all the way down to her toes. She was suddenly terrified. Do superheroes die? She said out loud. Her father stopped laughing. Listen, he said, we won't let him die. Flora's heart thudded again, a different kind of thud. It wasn't fear this time. It was hope. Does that mean you won't try to hit him over the head with a shovel, she said? I won't, said her father. Ever? Ever. You promise? I promise. Her father looked at her in the rearview mirror. Flora looked back. Let's go to your place then, she said. He'll be safe there. At these words, George Buckman started laughing hysterically. Again. Chapter 35. Fear Smells. Flora's father never walked through the hallways of the Blixen Arms. He ran, and Flora Buckman, holding her possibly concussed squirrel, ran with him. 
Flora and George Buckman ran because the Blixen Arms was owned and managed by a man named Mr. Claus, who was in possession of an enormous, angry orange cat, also named Mr. Claus. The cat, Mr. Claus, prowled the hallways of the Blixen Arms, peeing on the residence doors and vomiting in the stairwells. Mr. Claus was also notorious for hiding in the green gloom of the hallways and waiting until some unlucky person stepped out of the door of his or her apartment or into the main entrance of the Blicks and Arms, or down into the basement laundry room, and then pouncing on the person's ankles, biting and scratching and growling, and sometimes, weirdly enough, purring. Flora's father's ankles were scarred. <laughs> Flora's father's ankles were deeply scarred. The cat can smell your fear, Flora shouted as she ran. It's a scientific fact. She had read about fear and terrible things can happen to you. Fear smells, said terrible things, and the smell of fear further incites the predator. Ahead of her, his father laughed his hearty and seemingly endless laugh. If Flora had more time, she would have said, for the love of Pete, what's so funny? But she didn't have time. There was a squirrel to save. And that's the end of that chapter section. So we're going to jump back to our little menu and we're gonna take a look at our next section. So chapter 36, again, the tippy top is cut off, but that's okay because I have it in my book. So, just have to find it. <laughs> so, chapter 36 is titled Surprise, Anger, Joy. Flora stood and stared at the sign on apartment 267. It was made of fake wood and engraved with white letters that spelled out the words residing within the doctor's Misham. What was the apostrophe doing there? Did the doctors own the Misham? And what was it with exclamation marks? Did people not know what they were for? Surprise, anger, joy. That's what exclamation marks were for. They had nothing to do with who resided where. But at this particular moment, the exclamation mark seemed entirely appropriate. It was terribly exciting that a doctor who didn't know how to use apostrophes lived in apartment 267. What are you staring at? Said her father. He was putting his key into the door of apartment 271 and he was laughing softly. A doctor lives there, said Flora. Dr. Misham, said her father. I'm going to see if he can help us with Ulysses, said Flora. Excellent idea, said her father. He opened the door of his apartment. He looked to the left and then to the right. Keep your eyes open for Mr. Claus, he said. I'll join you in a bit. He slammed the door just as Flora raised her hand to knock on Dr. Misham's door. But she didn't get the chance to knock. The door swung open of its own accord. An old lady stood there smiling, her dentures glowing white in the perpetual green twilight of the hallway. Someone inside the apartment was screaming. No, someone was singing. It was opera, opera music. At last, said the old lady. I'm so glad to see your face. Flora turned and looked behind her. I'm speaking to you, little flower. Me, said Flora. Yes, you, little flower. Flora Bell, beloved of your father, Mr. George Buckman. Come in, little flower, come in. Actually, said Flora, I'm looking for a doctor. I have a medical emergency. Of course, of course, said the woman. We are, all of us, medical emergencies. You must come in now. I've been waiting for so long. She reached out and yanked Flora over the threshold of 267 and into the apartment. The criminal element had a lot to say about entering the home of a stranger. They suggested that you do so at your own risk and that if you did make the questionable decision to enter the home of someone you didn't know, a door to the outside world should be left open at all times to facilitate a quick escape. The old lady slammed the door shut. The opera music was very loud now. Flora looked down at the hand that was on her arm. It was spotted and wrinkled. Beloved, thought Flora. Me? Here we have Flora with um, Ulysses in her arms and then this old lady who we're guessing is Dr. Misham. Residing within the doctor's Misham. Chapter 37, Singing with the Angels. He woke with a single giant watery eye staring at him. He blinked. His head hurt. The gigantic eye was mesmerizing and beautiful. It was like staring at a small planet, a whole sad and lonely world. Ulysses found it hard to look away. He stared at the eye and the eye stared back. Was he dead? Had he been hit over the head with a shovel? He could hear someone singing. He knew he should be afraid, but he didn't feel afraid. So much had happened to him in the last 24 hours that somewhere along the way, he had stopped worrying. Everything had become interesting as opposed to worrisome. If he was dead, well, that was interesting too. My eyesight was not what it was, said a voice. When I was a girl in Blunder Mason, I could read the sign before anyone else even saw the sign. Not that it helped me seeing things clearly. Sometimes it is safer not to see. In Blunder Mason, the words on the sign were often not the truth. And I ask you, 
what good does it do you to read the words of a lie? But that is a different story. I will tell you that story later. I find this magnifying glass to be of great assistance. Yes, yes, I see him. He is very much alive. I know he's alive, said another voice. I can tell that. Flora, Flora was here with him. How comforting. Hmm, yes, I see. He is a squirrel. For the love of Pete, said Flora, I know he's a squirrel. He is missing much fur, said the voice. What kind of doctor are you, said Flora. The voices in the room kept singing. They were full of sadness and love and desperation. The voice belonging to the giant eye hummed along with them. Ulysses tried to get to his feet. A gentle hand pushed him back. I am the Dr. Misham, who is the doctor of philosophy, said the voice. My husband, the other Dr. Misham, was the medical doctor, but he has passed away. This is a euphemism, of course. I mean to say that he is dead. He has departed from this world. He is somewhere and singing with the angels. Ha, there is another euphemism, singing with the angels. I ask you, why is it so hard to stay away from euphemisms? They creep in always and attempt to make the difficult things more pleasing. So let me try again. He is dead, the other Dr. Misham, the medical one, and I hope that he is somewhere singing, perhaps singing something for Mozart, but who knows where he is and what he is doing. For the love of Pete, said Flora, I need a medical doctor. Ulysses might have a concussion. Shh, calm down. Why are you so agitated? There is no need to worry. You were worried about what? You will tell me what happened that makes you think concussion. He hit a door, said Flora, with his head. Hmm, yes, this could give a concussion. When I was a girl in Blundermeason, people were often getting concussions. Gifts from the trolls, you understand. Gifts from the trolls, said Flora. What are you talking about? Look at him. Does he look like he has a concussion? The gigantic eye of Dr. Misham came closer, much closer. It studied him. The beautiful voices sang. Dr. Misham hummed. Ulysses felt strangely peaceful. If he spent the rest of his life being stared at by the giant eye and hummed over, things could be worse. The pupils of his little eyes are not dilated, said Dr. Misham. Dilated pupil, said Flora. I couldn't remember that one. So this is good. This is a hopeful sign. Next, we will see if he remembers what happens. We will check for amnesia. Flora's face came into view. He was glad to see her and her round head. Ulysses, she said, do you remember what happened? Do you remember being in the giant donut? Did he remember being in Rita's hair? Did he remember Rita screaming? Did he remember the man with the knife? Did he remember flying? Did he remember hitting his head very hard? Did he remember not getting to eat a giant donut? Let's see. Yes, 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 and yes. He nodded. Oh, said Dr. Misham. He nods his head. He communicates with you. He's, um, different. Special, said Flora. A special kind of squirrel. Excellent, good, I believe this. Something happened to him. Yes, he hit a door with his head. No, said Flora, before that. He was vacuumed, you know, sucked up in a vacuum cleaner. There was a small silence, and then there was more humming from Dr. Misham. Ulysses tried again to get to his feet and was again pushed gently back. Are you speaking euphemistically, said Dr. Misham? I'm not, said Flora. I'm speaking literally. He was vacuumed. It changed him. Certainly it did, said Dr. Misham. Apparently it changed him to be vacuumed. She raised her magnifying glass to, to her eye and leaned in close, studying him. She lowered the magnifying glass. How did it change him, please? Lucy stood on all fours and no one pushed him back. You will speak without euphemisms, said Dr. Misham. He has powers, said Flora. He's strong and he can fly, she paused. Also, he types. He writes, um, poetry. A typewriter? Poetry? Flight, said Dr. Misham. She sounded delighted. His name is Ulysses. This, said Dr. Misham, is an important name. Well, said Flora, it was the name of the vacuum cleaner that almost killed him. Dr. Misham looked Ulysses in the eye. It was rare for someone to look a squirrel in the eye. Ulysses pulled himself up straighter. He looked back at Dr. Misham. He met her gaze. You must also list among his powers the ability to understand. This is no small thing to understand, Dr. Misham said to Flora. And then she turned back to Ulysses. You are feeling maybe a little sick to the stomach? Ulysses shook his head. Good, said Dr. Misham. She clapped her hands together. I am thinking that Ulysses is not concussed. There is only this little cut on his head. Other than that, fine, good, great. I am thinking that maybe the squirrel is hungry. Ulysses nodded. Yes, yes, he was very hungry. He would like eggs sunny side up. He would like a donut with sprinkles. Chapter 38, Unremitting Darkness. You, said Dr. Meacham to Flora, will have a seat on the sofa and listen to the Mozart, and I will go and make us some sandwiches. What about my father, said Flora? Shouldn't I tell him where I am? 
Mr. George Buckman knows where you are, said Dr. Misham. He knows that you are safe. So good. All is good. You will sit on the horse care sofa, please. Dr. Misham went into the kitchen and Flora turned and looked at the couch. It was a huge couch. She dutifully sat down on it and then slowly, very slowly, slid off it. Wow, she said. She climbed back up on the couch and concentrated on staying put. She sat with her hands on either side of her and her legs straight out in front of her. She felt like an oversized doll. She also felt very, very tired and a tiny bit confused. Maybe I'm in shock, she thought. Terrible things can happen to you had done an issue listing the symptoms of shock, but Flora couldn't remember what they were. Was one of the symptoms of shock that you couldn't remember the symptoms of shock? She looked over at Ulysses. He was still sitting on the dining room table. He looked confused too. She waved at him and he nodded back. And then she noticed that there was a picture hanging on the wall opposite the couch. It was a painting of what looked like nothing but darkness, unremitting darkness. Flora slid off the couch and walked over to the painting and stared at it more closely. In the middle of all the darkness, there was a tiny boat. It was floating on a black sea. Flora put her face up right against the painting. Something was wrapped around the boat, some tentacled shadow. For the love of Pete, the tiny boat on the dark sea was getting eaten by a giant squid. Flora's heart protested with a small thud of fear. Holy bagoomba, she whispered. From the kitchen, there came the sound of clinking silverware and crashing plates. The opera music ended. Ulysses, said Flora. She looked behind her and saw the squirrel sitting on the floor, sniffing his tail. Come here, she said to him. He walked over to her and she picked him up and put him on her shoulder. Look, she said. He stared at the painting. The boat is getting eaten by a giant squid. He nodded. It's a tragedy, said Flora. There are people on board that boat. Look, you can see them. They're ant-sized, but they're people. Ulysses squinted. He nodded again. They're all going to die, explained Flora. Every last one of them. As a superhero, you should be outraged. You should want to save them. Incandesto would. Ah, said Dr. Misham, coming up behind them. You are studying my poor, lonely giant squid. Lonely, said Flora. The giant squid is the loneliest of all God's creatures. He can sometimes go for the whole of his life without seeing another of his kind. For some reason, Dr. Misham's words conjured up the face of William Spiver, white-haired and dark-eyed. Flora's heart squinched up. Go away, William Spiver, she thought. That squid is a villain, said Flora out loud. He needs to be vanquished. He's eating a boat, and he's going to eat all the people on the boat. Yes, well, loneliness makes us do terrible things, said Dr. Misham, and that is why the picture is there, to remind me of this, also because the other Dr. Misham painted it when he was young and joyful. Good grief, thought Flora. What did he paint when he was old and depressed? Now you will sit on the horsehair sofa, please, said Dr. Misham, and I will bring out the jelly sandwiches. Flora sat down on the couch. Ulysses was still on her shoulder. She put up her hand and touched him. He was warm. He was a small engine of warmness. The giant squid The giant squid is the loneliest creature in all existence, said Flora out loud. And then, to keep things grounded and in perspective, she muttered, seal blubber. And then she whispered, do not hope. Instead, observe. She kept her hand on the squirrel. We have Flora and Ulysses both looking at the painting. Chapter 39, The Tears Roll Off. Dr. Misham came out of the kitchen holding a pink plate with small sandwiches on it. She sat down next to Flora. You are enjoying this horsehair sofa, she said to Flora. I guess, said Flora. She wasn't sure exactly how someone enjoyed a horsehair sofa. You will eat a jelly sandwich, said Dr. Misham. She extended the plate to Flora. Ulysses leapt off Flora's shoulder and into her lap. He sniffed the plate. Our patient is hungry, said Dr. Misham. He never had breakfast, said Flora. She took two sandwiches and handed one to Ulysses. This sofa, said Dr. Misham, is the sofa of my grandmother. She was born on this sofa in Blundermeesen. She lived the whole of her life there, and she is buried there in a dark wood. But that is of a different story. What I meant to say is that when I was a girl in Blundermeesen, I sat on the sofa and spoke with my grandmother about inconsequential things well into the gloom of the evening. That is what a girl in Blundermeesen did in those days. She was expected to speak of inconsequential things as the gloom of the evening descended. Also, she must knit. Always the gloom was descending on Blundermeesen. Always, always one was knitting outfits for the little trolls. What little trolls, said Flora, and where's Blundermeesen? Never mind about the trolls for now. I meant only to say that life was very gloomy then, and one was always knitting. It sounds lousy, said Flora. It was exactly this. Lousy, said Dr. Misham. She smiled. Her dentures were very bright. There was a smear of grape jelly on one of her fake incisors. 
Flora reached for another sandwich. Had terrible things can happen to you ever warned against eating jelly sandwiches in the house of a woman from Blundermeesen? Your father is a lonely man, said Dr. Misham. Also, very sad. To leave you, this broke his heart. It did, said Flora. Yes, yes. Mr. George Buckman has sat on this horsehair sofa many times. He has talked of his sadness. He has wept. This sofa has seen the tears of many people. It is a sofa that is good for tears. They roll off it, you see. Her father had sat on this couch and wept as the gloom of the evening descended. Flora suddenly felt like she might cry too. What was wrong with her? Seal blubber, she thought. The words steadied her. She handed another sandwich to Ulysses. Your father is very capacious of heart, said Dr. Misham. Do you know what this means? Flora shook her head. It means the heart of George Buckman is large. It is capable of containing much joy and much sorrow. Oh, said Flora. For some reason, she heard William Spiber's voice saying that the universe was a random place. Capacious heart, said Dr. Misham's voice. Random universe, said William Spiber's. Capacious, random, heart, universe. Flora felt dizzy. I'm a cynic, she announced for no particular reason and in a too loud voice. Bah, cynics, said Dr. Misham. Cynics are people who are afraid to believe. She waved her hand in front of her face as if she were brushing away a fly. Do you believe in, um, things, said Flora? Yes, yes, I believe, said Dr. Misham. She smiled her too bright smile again. You've heard of Pascal's wager? No, said Flora. Pascal, said Dr. Misham, had it that since it could not be proven whether God existed, one might as well believe that he did, because there was everything to gain by believing and nothing to lose. This is how it is for me. What do I lose if I choose to believe? Nothing. Take this squirrel, for instance, Ulysses. Do I believe he can type poetry? Sure, I do believe it. There is much more beauty in the world if I believe such a thing is possible. Flora and Dr. Misham looked at Ulysses. He was holding half a sandwich in his front paws. There were blobs of grape jelly in his whiskers. Do you know what a superhero is, said Flora? Sure, I know what a superhero is. Ulysses is a superhero, said Flora, but he hasn't really done anything heroic yet. Mostly he's just flown around. He lifted a vacuum cleaner over his head. He wrote some poetry. He hasn't saved anyone, though. And that's what superheroes are supposed to do, save people. Who knows what he will do, said Dr. Misham. Who knows whom he will save? So many miracles have not yet happened. Flora watched as one of the jelly blobs on Ulysses' whiskers trembled and fell in slow motion to the horsehair sofa. All things are possible, said Dr. Misham. When I was a girl in Blunder Mason, the miraculous happened every day, or every other day, or every third day. Actually, sometimes it did not happen at all, even on the third day. But still, we expected it. You will see what you see what I'm saying? Even when it didn't happen, we were expecting it. We knew the miraculous would come. There was a knock at the door. See, said Dr. Misham, that will be your father, Mr. George Buckman. Flora stood and went to the door and opened it. It was her father, and he was smiling, again, still, which did seem kind of miraculous. Hi, Pop, she said. You see, said Dr. Misham, he smiles. Flora's father, Flora's father's smile got bigger. He took off his hat. He bowed. George Buckman, he said. How do you do? Flora couldn't help it. She smiled, too. She was still smiling when a noise that sounded like the end of the world echoed through the hallway of the Blixen Arms. One minute, her father was standing there with his hat in his hands, smiling, and the next minute, Mr. Claus, the cat one, came out of nowhere and landed right on top of George Buckman's unprotected head. Chapter 40, Vanquished. Fortunately, a superhero was present. Then we have Mr. Claus, sunny side up! We have Ulysses on top of Mr. Claus, who's on top of Mr. Buckman, and Ulysses pulling the cat off of Mr. Buckman and picking him up and throwing him all the way down the hallway. For the love of Pete, holy bagoomba! And there's Mr. Claus looking not too well. Vanquished. And the superhero was enormously, inordinately pleased with himself. He felt immensely powerful. He felt like writing a poem. And that is the end of our second chapter section. Tune in next week to see what happens to Mr. Claus and Mr. Buckman's head and the poem that Ulysses writes.